Hello, everybody. Welcome. My name is Mia Hemsad. I'm the Senior Communications Manager at the Maternal Mental Health Leadership Alliance. And today we are presenting a webinar on disability, pregnancy, and maternal mental health. We just want to say on behalf of everybody at MMHLA, thank you so much for taking the time to learn about this very important topic, to learn about the needs of this underrepresented community, and what we can all do to better support them and their perinatal mental health outcomes. This webinar is the second of a four-part webinar series called Delving into Maternal Mental Health, which is made possible by a grant from the California Healthcare Foundation, so thank you to them. I also want to acknowledge and thank the University of Toronto and the National Center for Disability and Pregnancy Research, both incredible organizations that are represented today by our incredible presenters who you're going to meet in just a minute. So we want to make sure that everybody has a positive experience today. So let's re-familiarize ourselves with Zoom, even though we're all very, very familiar, but just some highlights. If you would like to ask us a question, there is a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, so feel free to use that. And if you would like to express your question in ASL or sign, please let us know in the Q&A box, and our tech support will make sure that you can come on video and express yourself in that way. If you would like to turn on live captions, you can do so using the show captions button to see the live captions of everything that we're saying today. And if you would like to react to this webinar, share a heart, an emoji, you can do that with the reactions button. And if you would like to make sure you can see and view our ASL interpreters, there is an interpretation button at the bottom of your screen. And again, if you have any questions, feel free to drop that in the Q&A button. Any tech issues, we have James on tech support and he will be able to support you with that today. So a quick overview of the Maternal Mental Health Leadership Alliance, or MMHLA, as we like to call ourselves for short. We are a nonpartisan 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to improving the mental health of all moms and childbearing people in the U.S. with a specific focus on policy and health equity. We're going to cover a lot of topics today, but a brief overview of perinatal mental health among women with disabilities. We'll tackle that first. Then we're gonna learn about ableism and its impact on people with disabilities. Then we're gonna hear about a pilot program that is designed to improve the perinatal health of pregnant people with disabilities. And lastly, we're gonna hear from Dr. Ayers, who's gonna share her lived experience with perinatal health as a disabled mom. So lots to cover today. After this webinar, we will email you a brief survey. We would love to get your feedback. It really helps us improve our webinars and provide you with topics that you want to learn more about. And we're going to share all of the slides, which have the links and everything that you need, including the research that we reference and all of those citations. And you will also get the webinar recording. Those will come in an email to you tomorrow. We also want to be mindful of how some information can be challenging for some people and also triggering for some, and so please feel free to take breaks as needed. Now I get the privilege of introducing our presenters for today, starting off with Dr. Hillary Brown. She will be providing the overview and the research of this topic. Dr. Brown is an associate professor at the University of Toronto. She is an adjunct scientist at the Women's College Hospital and the Institute for Clinical Evaluative Sciences and she holds a Tier 2 Canada Research Chair in Disability and Reproductive Health. We are so grateful that she is joining us today and going to be sharing all of her exper experience and expertise. Then we will be, um, then we'll get an amazing presentation from Dr. Kara Ayers, who will be sharing about her lived experience, as well as potential strategies to improve perinatal health. She is the Associate Director at the University of Cincinnati Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities. She is the Associate Professor of Pediatrics at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center. She's also the co-founder of the Disabled Parenting Project and the co-investigator at the National Center for Disability and Pregnancy Research. So again, so grateful and excited for you all to learn from her. Um, it's gonna be an amazing presentation. So before we dive in and let the presenters um, take it away, we wanna make sure that we're all on the same page on the crisis that is happening with maternal mental health in the United States. Um, please know that all the key facts and statistics I'm, that I'm about to share, we have research and evidence to back up every single one of the things that we share, which will be referenced in the last slide of this presentation, which you should have received earlier today, and we'll also receive another link to the presentation slides tomorrow. 
So we know that one in five moms are impacted by mental health conditions. Maternal mental health conditions are the most common complication of pregnancy and birth, affecting 800,000 families each year in the U.S. We also know, according to the CDC research, that suicide and overdose are the leading cause of death for women in the first year following pregnancy. The evidence also states that not treating maternal mental health conditions is costing the U.S. economy big time at $14 billion each year in the U.S. or $32,000 per mother infant pair. Most individuals who experience maternal mental health conditions are not being treated. That number comes up to 75%. And that lack of treatment causes a ripple effect of negative outcomes on mothers, childbearing people, their babies, and their families. We also know from many research and studies that certain individuals are at increased risk for experiencing maternal mental health conditions, including people of color, those impacted by poverty, military service members, and their spouses. And we also want to highlight that postpartum depression is not the only maternal mental health condition that someone can experience. There is actually a range of conditions that we want to educate everybody about. And that can include anxiety disorders, obsessive compulsive disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, bipolar illness, psychosis, and substance use disorders. We are gonna cover so much information today in just one hour, but there is more information, research, statistics, and resources. And so we've compiled all of that in a brand new fact sheet on this specific topic, disability, pregnancy, and maternal mental health. So we will be sharing that fact sheet with all of you in tomorrow's follow-up email. Now, without further delay, I'm excited to pass off the presentation to Dr. Hillary Brown. Dr. Brown, go ahead and take it away. Wonderful. Thank you so much for the introduction and for the opportunity to speak today. Um, as was mentioned, I'm going to provide an overview of current research on perinatal mental health in women with disabilities. Next slide, please. So as was mentioned, I'm a researcher at the University of Toronto, so I'm coming to you from north of the border, uh, but I'll be presenting on some research, uh, you know, from studies globally, as well as some work that we've done in our own group. Um, so just by way of background, about 20% of reproductive aged women have a disability. When I speak of disability, I'm talking about both visible and invisible disabilities, including physical disabilities that impact mobility, such as spinal cord injuries or rheumatoid arthritis. This also includes sensory disabilities that impact vision and hearing, as well as intellectual and developmental disabilities that impact cognition, learning, and adaptive skills, including autism spectrum disorder and fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. So we're talking about a range of experiences of, of people across the population. In relation to reproductive health, in 2005, the World Health Organization published a landmark report that called for better reproductive health care for women with disabilities. And yet, nearly 20 years after the publication of that report, women with disabilities continue to report being underserved in reproductive health care settings, and this includes in perinatal mental health care. Next slide, please. So when we talk about this to uh, topic, I think it's really important to consider the historical context of reproductive health care for people with disabilities. Throughout much of the 20th century, institutionalization and involuntary sterilization of people with disabilities was quite common. These practices ended sometime between the 1970s and late 1980s, depending on where you live. But, you know, this is not so much in the distant past, and I think a lot of the negative uh, societal stereotypes and assumptions and ableism that have come from this historical context continue to impact the experiences of people with disabilities when they access reproductive health care. They often experience negative reactions from providers about uh, sexuality and pregnancy. And so it's really important to keep this context in mind. And I know the second presenter will be speaking a lot more about current uh, issues related to ableism that have stemmed from many of these historical uh, practices. Next slide. <laughs> 
Also important for context, we know from research on people with disabilities more broadly that this is a population that experiences significant social and health disparities. This includes uh, inadequate access to sexual and reproductive health education in childhood and adolescence. People with disabilities also experience barriers accessing education and employment. They're more likely than their peers without disabilities to experience uh, housing instability and poverty. They're also more likely to experience social isolation as well as intimate partner violence. There are numerous barriers accessing healthcare services for people with disabilities. And of course, we continue to see examples of stigma and bias and ableism uh, in our society as a whole. And the reason why these factors are so important is that we know from the broader literature that each of these social and health factors are risk factors for perinatal mental illness. And so these are important contextual pieces to keep in mind when we consider the perinatal mental health uh, experiences of people with disabilities. Next slide. Okay. So one of the reasons why we um, have seen very little research on disability and pregnancy in the past is because historically it was sort of assumed that pregnancy was uncommon in people with disabilities, again, stemming from many of these kind of historical eugenic processes that existed for much of the 20th century. However, research now shows that pregnancy is not uncommon in people with disabilities. And in research from my group, for example, we've shown that pregnancy rates in people with physical and sensory disabilities are fairly comparable to pregnancy rates in people without disabilities. They tend to be a little bit lower in people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, but certainly not uncommon. And in total, about one in every eight pregnancies in the population are to an individual with some kind of disability. So again, really highlighting the importance of understanding reproductive health in this group, including perinatal mental health. Next slide, please. So there has been a, a number of studies that have looked at perinatal physical health outcomes, uh, including maternal and newborn complications. So for example, meta-analyses show that people with disabilities are at elevated risk for common complications of pregnancy, like gestational diabetes, gestational hypertension, and cesarean delivery. There's also emerging research showing that they're at elevated risk for severe maternal morbidity, as well as maternal mortality. In terms of newborn complications, meta-analyses also show elevated risk of both preterm birth and low birth weight, as well as other newborn complications. And again, these are important uh, outcomes to consider in the context of perinatal mental health, because we know that difficulties in pregnancy can lead to vulnerabilities to mental illness in the postpartum period. Next slide. So there have been a number of previous studies on perinatal mental health specifically. For example, a descriptive study in Australian women with intellectual and developmental disabilities showed that about one third of them had moderate to severe depression and anxiety, as well as stress in the prenatal period. Population-based data from the US also show that women with disabilities are at about a 60% increased risk of postpartum depression compared to their peers without disabilities. And there's also been a number of studies showing the various stressors that women with disabilities might experience during the perinatal period that can contribute to some of these mental health outcomes, um, including low social support and uh, ableism by healthcare providers. And I'll provide some examples of those in just a moment. Next slide. So to provide a little bit more detail on this topic, I'd like to highlight some research that my team has done. Um, we used uh, population-based data to try to understand perinatal mental health in women with disabilities. We used whole population health administrative data to look at perinatal mental health outcomes in women with compared to without disabilities. And then we interviewed about 32 women with disabilities about the stressors that they experienced in pregnancy in the postpartum period. Um, and we were able to gain some information on how these might impact their uh, perinatal mental health. Next slide. 
So from our uh, population-based data, we first looked at preconception mental health. So this is the mental health of individuals prior to pregnancy. And one of the reasons why we wanted to start with this is because we know that a history of mental illness is one of the strongest risk factors for perinatal mental illness. And with our data, we were able to show that women with physical, sensory, intellectual, and developmental disabilities, as well as multiple disabilities, had higher rates of mood or anxiety disorders, psychotic disorders, substance use disorders, other mental illness, as well as self-harm compared to their peers without disabilities. Now, this is consistent with what we know uh, from the research on people with disabilities more broadly, but this was a study that was able to pinpoint that this is a pattern that's also seen in women in the preconception period. Next slide. So next, we looked at the occurrence of perinatal mental illness, and we stratified our analyses according to whether individuals had a history of perinatal mental, of, of preconception mental illness. And as expected, we see high rates of perinatal mental illness in people with a history of mental illness, with even higher rates in women with disabilities compared to those without disabilities. However, I think what's really striking is even in people with no history of mental illness, we see higher rates of mood or anxiety disorders, psychotic disorders, other mental illness, substance use disorders, as well as self-harm, although it's rare, in people with disabilities compared to those without disabilities. So that really shows the importance of understanding outcomes in the perinatal period. Next slide. So I want to highlight um, a few quotes from the qualitative research that we did on this topic. And I want to preface these quotes by saying that we, of course, spoke to many individuals who had really positive pregnancy experiences. So I want to really stress the fact that, um, you know, pregnancy is a very happy time for most mothers. But as we know, postpartum depression is common. And so the quotes that I'm going to uh, provide for you really show some of the stressors that are uh, experienced by this population population and that might uh, contribute to some of the elevated risk of postpartum depression. One of the first pieces that we really talked about was negative provider assumptions, including negative reactions to a pregnancy. So we spoke to one mother who uses a wheelchair and she described meeting her doctor for the first time when she went in to confirm her pregnancy. She said, I went in and I said to him, and he was like, what brings you here? Oh, I just found out that I'm pregnant. And he looked down at my wheelchair for a second and he looked at me and he said, are you here to get an abortion? And I was absolutely stunned. My mouth fell open. I didn't know what to say. I guess he looked at my wheelchair and thought, you don't want it, I guess. It was like, no, we've been trying for a year and we're really excited. And that was a really weird and terrible kind of experience. So not a very nice sort of reaction to uh, your first pregnancy care experience. Next slide, please. Another common theme that we saw across interviews was just the lack of professional support uh, related to mental health and even pregnancy more broadly. So one individual said, I was just a number. The doctor gave me some instructions to how to follow up and when to do it during my pregnancy. But then after that, there was no follow up. So what happened? There were no resources for postpartum depression. Uh, here's a pamphlet. And I said, oh, whatever. They think you're going to go and call everybody. If I was screened at the hospital that you're at risk for postpartum depression, which I think I was, I needed more mental health support. I think that would have been really helpful. Next slide, please. A related finding was that people really experienced gaps in their postpartum care specifically. So they really felt like supports just fell away after they delivered their baby. One individual said, there were no resources. I just had the baby and we're done with you. You know, when you're high risk, it's a double-edged sword. One, okay, great. You have the obstetrician looking after you, but after you deliver the baby, you're done. Nothing happens. If I'm high risk, wouldn't I still be high risk six weeks after the postpartum? Next slide, please. One really interesting finding that we saw was a real lack of disability affirming services. So services that had a positive view of disability in parenting and would provide strength-based supports. So one individual said it would have been really helpful to have some sort of mental health support or just support from other disabled people. Because I remember feeling very isolated and all the people I was seeing, they didn't get it. And I also was wary of appearing to struggle too much. So if there was a way to have a safe person to share what you're struggling with, maybe someone who actually sat you down and said, I know this is an issue with disability. I'm aware of it. These are the only instances that I would call Child Protective Services. 
I would have more trust if I knew the person was aware of that or were disabled themselves. Next slide, please. A lot of moms talked about the need to feel like they were proving themselves. And I think a lot of people experience this in the postpartum period, but it was especially a poignant point for many uh, disabled mothers, especially considering uh, sort of the fears that many of them had around child protective services. So one mother said, as a disabled mom, I had I felt I had to make it seem like I was doing better than any quote normal mom because I was afraid if people thought I couldn't do it, then they would assume that it was a mistake for me to have a kid. I didn't reach out to supports because I was trying to hide. That was really hard. Even if people told me, yes, it's really hard, I felt I had to still prove that I was doing okay. Next slide, please. One finding that we saw that was really interesting was um, this idea of sort of the perceived dangers of leaving people without uh, mental health supports, especially for individuals who are taking uh, medications related to pain management. So this one mother said, I think that was brushed off and it's so dangerous. If you have a mom with a high risk of postpartum depression who has heavy, hardcore painkillers at home, I think that's a deadly combination. I was almost suicidal. I was disappointed in that way. I definitely wish that there was some sort of mental health support and something that you can probably get started towards the end of the pregnancy and continue on, not just do uh, up until the baby comes and see if you're going to develop postpartum depression. Next slide, please. So for the last quote that I'm going to share, I just want to really reiterate this kind of fear of intrusive surveillance and child protective services that really impeded people from accessing mental health supports. So this mother said, it took me uh, to get the parenting program worker and the adult protective service worker, which is a social worker uh, role where we are, and every other support involved in order for my child to be home. I had child protective services involvement for my previous kid. I didn't feel very open about having all these people come and be involved in my life because I thought everybody would be against me instead of trying to help me. So hopefully these quotes give you a sense of some of the stressors that people with disabilities might experience in the postpartum period and perinatal period more broadly and how that might impact mental health. Um, and with that, I'll hand it over to our next speaker um, who will speak more about ableism and uh, clinical interventions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Next slide. So I'm Kara Ayers, um, and I'm going to address uh, some of the connections of what Dr. Brown has discussed and um, kind of the underlying ableism that is unfortunately embedded in our healthcare systems, in our child protective services, and um, kind of the what's happening um, under the surface here to help us hopefully dismantle it and um, improve outcomes for these families. So this is a slide of me, a quick visual description. Um, I'm a white woman that in this picture is seated in my manual wheelchair um, and I have brown hair and I'm wearing a scarf. Um, and you've already heard about my different connections. Um, I'm trained as a psychologist. So that is kind of the angle that I come from, but also through the lens as a disabled person myself. So my research is often cross disability, meaning that um, I've recognized that we often have more in common um, across our different disability types or diagnoses because of our experience in society. Um, so I rarely kind of specify by diagnosis. And another thing that my research has in common is that it's based on active um, participation by uh, disabled people as co-researchers and part of the process as well. So I'm not um, studying people so much as uh, studying topics with people. Next slide. There we go. Um, so there are a lot of different ways to define ableism, um, but I wanted to point out some of the key points that I think are most relevant to this conversation. So ableism in its basic form is discrimination and social prejudice against people with disabilities based on the idea that non-disabled people are superior. And I think what's really important to pull out from that definition is that um, unintentionally that idea that non-disability is superior is built into a lot of our um, healthcare training and approaches where our top goal is really to eradicate disability. Even if we know that it's not possible, we're taught that we want to try to um, 
get rid of as much evidence of disability. You know, you see um, examples of therapies that teach people to um, kind of act less disabled or behave in a less disabled way. And now we're understanding that in some cases that can be harmful as we hear more discussion around like masking with autism. Um, so I think in one way you can read this definition and say, you know, yep, that's ableism and that's terrible and I don't do that. Um, but I think that we also need to recognize that we live within a society that sends us that message that non-disabled people are superior every single day. And so we have to actively work to unlearn that um, rather than just kind of passively assume that we wouldn't perpetuate that. So it's also fascinating, I think, to understand that ableism harms people with and without disabilities. So the um, problems that ableism brings up in our systems um, cause worse, worse healthcare outcomes for all of us. And while that's frustrating and sad. It's also, I think, hopefully plants a seed of hope and motivation for you and also something that you can take to leadership and people that have um, opportunities to change policy and that um, anti-ableist work improves our healthcare systems overall. So this isn't something that we're doing for just a few people. You know, I often tell people that most disabled parents don't look like me. I look very visibly disabled according to what society expects in terms of that I'm in a wheelchair. Um, but most disabled parents don't necessarily uh, use a wheelchair. They may look differently, but by improving services, systems, policies for disabled parents, um, you are gonna improve for everyone. So that hopefully is another bit of motivation for you. Um, and then in addition to um, inadvertently perpetuating ableism, our training that healthcare providers across a number of disciplines receive often lacks a focus on disability, which is another part of the problem. And I have a reference there if you want to learn more. Um, just in the last couple of days, there are some really exciting advancements, um, including some federal funding that will promote um, training for a range of providers on disability, some significant federal funding as well as just yesterday, a designation by the NIH that people with disabilities are a health disparity population. And so this has been something that's been a goal for years and years. Um, and just a couple of weeks ago, a recommendation actually came out to um, not designate people with disabilities as a health disparity population. And a number of disabled researchers, including myself, um, signed onto letters and really advocated for why that recommendation was problematic. Um, and so yesterday it was a very exciting surprise that um, indeed the NIH made the decision to declare this group a health disparity group, which means that it will open up all kinds of opportunities for research on understanding the impact of ableism on maternal mental health and number of other um, outcomes and topic areas. So we're really excited about that. Next slide. So I want to um, briefly address that when we say ableism, it's a big umbrella, lots of things under that umbrella. Um, and I want to point out three types of ableism, um, the first of which being internalized ableism, which means that the exposure to these messages doubting our parenthood, our ch childbearing ability, our ability to be a good parent um, can often be internalized and taken in um, without people realizing. And so they also may have um, doubts about their own um, abilities with parenting or, um, you know, their pregnancy that are unfortunately often reinforced by society. So sometimes people will avoid healthcare or miss preventative appointments um, because they may have internalized these beliefs that it's expected that their health is poor or that um, it is expected that their healthcare takes more work, is more um, burdensome from what they feel like when they go to a doctor. Um, so kind of believing these messages about themselves and therefore not pursuing the best um, in, in care for themselves. Next slide. The second type of ableism is inter interpersonal ableism. And so this is probably the one that you've heard more about um, in terms of doctor-patient relationships. Um, this, you know, Dr. Brown gave examples of this when the doctor looked at the patient in the wheelchair and said, are you here for an abortion? Um, many of us have many, uh, unfortunately, examples of this. I also went to a 
genetic counseling appointment when I was in my early 20s and had asked um, for help in understanding the genetic inheritance of my disability if my partner also had my disability and um, was told by a genetic counselor at that time that if um, he were I, if he were me, I guess, um, that he would only adopt. And so at first I misunderstood this recommendation as based on um, health and uh, health of me or health of my future baby. Um, but as he continued to talk, I realized that it was entirely based on his beliefs about value and quality of life with a disability. Um, and that, uh, yeah, it had nothing actually to do with my medical uh, history or predictions for future health of me or my baby. Um, next slide. And then the third one that I want to share about is systemic ableism. So this is what is really built into the system. So we still have inaccessible clinics. We still have policies that allow doctors, um, OBs to turn down patients if they um, don't want to treat them, don't believe that they should have children, don't, and they may not explicitly say that. And I do recognize that this is um, challenging ground because, of course, we don't want providers to take on patients that they feel um incompetent to treat, but we also have to recognize the reality that many childbearing pregnant people um, with disabilities are traveling hours to get their prenatal care. I and mean, you can imagine how that becomes even more complicated once you add a baby to that mix. Um, and so they're traveling hours because they're being told by doctor after doctor that they won't accept that patient. And so this is an example of systemic ableism that is built in, and it trickles all the way down, I mean, to hospital policies as well, that some just range on not making sense. Like um, one that stands out to me and as I was discharged from the hospital, my, my hospital had a policy that the mother had to carry the baby. Um, and so my husband was like, well, why would she carry the baby? She just had a surgery. I can carry the baby. Um, but they had this interesting policy that the, the father or the partner had to drive the car around to the curb and the mother had to leave carrying the baby. Um, and so we had to work a surprising amount of time to get them to understand that it made more sense in, in our situation and probably others for dad to um, baby wear and um, mom to just handle myself after I had just had a major surgery. Um, so we got to work to get those systems up to par as well. Next slide. I like to use images to kind of um, challenge me to think in different ways about things and also teach people about topics. So I use an image um, related to smog and I found this very dramatic one. It's like kind of black and white and comic style and it's got a factory with the smog smokestacks like just pluming out everywhere. Um, and so uh, ableism up close, the explicit type of ableism, like some of the examples that I've given you is easy to point out, right? And we could imagine how that would be bad for our health in a very literal sense if we breathe, you know, we're breathing in this smog on a regular basis. But if we live a few miles from this factory, that smog is still in the air. It is still negatively impacting our health. And, um, but there may be more debate about whether it's impacting our health, how it's impacting our health, what should we do to get it out? You know, is the answer to just move? Well, we leave the smog there for other people. Um, so I think that this helps us understand different types of ableism, implicit, explicit, meaning, you know, subtle forms of ableism. We could think about microaggressions with this. Um, an example of a microaggression, I think that pops up pretty frequently is for me, at least when I check in to healthcare providers and they're kind of um, asking me, you know, the intake process. And when they're surprised by seemingly basic information about me that is really not unusual for most of my same age peers. So when you're like extremely surprised that I tell you that I'm married and that I have children and that I have a job, um, it makes me start to wonder about what you assumed before I gave you that information and, um, and what, you know, your expectations are for people with disabilities. So that's an example of microaggression and probably a more subtle form of ableism that is harder to point out. Another um, concept or idea that this image reminds me of is that I was not, I was born with my disability, but I was not born with a smog mask. So again, remember that internalized ableism that um, we discussed just a few slides ago, and it's difficult to not take in those messages and believe them about ourselves. It can often happen unconsciously where we don't realize it. And then we find if, if we're working to be aware of this, we find that we're um, working really hard to overcompensate um, for 
ways that people doubt us or to really over explain ourselves. Um, or I notice that some people are very self deprecating, apologizing for literally just being in the room or taking up space because they feel like and get messages from society that we take up too much space and we take up too much time. Um, and so remembering that I wasn't given a smog mask and neither were my parents, you know, I was, uh, my disability was a surprise to my parents as, you know, is many people's. And I think it's unfair that we ascribe these kind of superhero identities to parents of kids with disabilities just strictly upon birth. So, you know, having a child with a disability does not mean that everything that society has taught you uh, um, through ableism, unfortunately, is just immediately erased. So you really have to work to undo that ableism. It is not undone by simply having a child with a disability. Um, and if we believe that, we um, unfortunately don't treat parents of kids with disabilities as whole people with histories and and we don't allow ourselves to do that work together um, which is really for the benefit of again the child but also all people because we know that ableism harms all of us next slide So we have um, talked through hopefully that ableism is often cumulative. A lot of times people don't understand it if it's taken out of context that, you know, you're really bothered that that, you know, nurse was surprised you have a job. Like it's not ever the one incident. It's the stacking effect that really feels like the weight is just holding you down. It's often implicit. Um, it is often unaddressed, even in diversity or anti-bias efforts. And unfortunately, it's often overlooked as contributing to mental health. So there's the conflation that disability itself must be the explanation for depression or anxiety. And while that could be a contributing factor, we should also look at ableism as a significant contributing factor to mental health, which is different fundamentally from the disability itself causing or explaining challenges with mental health. Next slide. So we want to commit to anti-ableism work, which centers disabled people, recognizes that we have other identities. I saw a great question just fly by in the corner of my eye about trans and non-binary birthing people with disabilities, which um, that group is definitely included in some of my research right now, talk, looking at developing pregnancy plans for people with disabilities. It includes active allyship, not performative. Um, and it's needed at the multiple levels. And if you're not familiar, this um, image on the right of this slide is the disability pride fl flag. Um, so hopefully you'll know what that is in July in the next month where we commemorate disability pride, but can celebrate all year, of course. Um, and I think the last note on disability pride is that anti-ableism work may include that, but we still need to do this work even if people are not or prefer or not to um, identify with pride. That's still sometimes different for people. Next slide. So I want to tell you a bit about a new um, pilot study that I am leading in that we're developing birth plans, um, which can reduce, we know that literature around birth plans shows that it can reduce anxiety, identify what questions you need asked and help people, um, pregnant people communicate with their teams. And so this is a peer to peer intervention that um, we lead over three to four zoom sessions. We identify uh, disability related needs, supports and strengths, and we just, directly discuss the impact of stigma and discrimination experienced by these pregnant people who participate in our um, APAP, Accessible Pregnancy Action Plan. Next slide. This slide gives you, I think, a quick visual of um, our first draft of this, this plan. Um, so you can see it's small, but um, this would be printed out in a, in a way that people could use. And so it's right now divided by plans for pregnancy, plans for labor and birth, and then supports um, for just after birth. And then we have, you know, ideas like providers can help buy uh, the best environment for me after birth or before birth, during birth. Um, and then it's centered around health empowerment theory. So um, it's also based on what matters most. And I see a quick question about the template. Um, it's actually intended to be used, you know, within the intervention, but, and this template has, um, is not the one we use right now. We've evolved to two more versions after this. Um, so definitely contact me afterwards though, because we are still piloting this. So we would love to have um, pregnant people with disabilities sign up. 
Next slide. So I want to end with a little bit of personal story. Oh, sorry, I forgot I had one um, quote here, which is really powerful, but I think I'm going to read, um, oh, I'll read the quote. I don't know of a lot of disabled parents, so, and you don't see or read much about disabled parenting unless it's in a negative way. Yeah, I guess like the stigma and like the effed up ways the mandated reporting can really interfere, interfere with disabled people becoming pregnant. And I feel like, I mean, I even like part of that, but you know, that's even like part of that, but you know that those are considerations that even go into not wanting to get an autism diagnosis because I know the way that can be viewed by the wrong person who's making passing judgment on my ability to be a parent. Fortunately, I think, fortunately and unfortunately, there's pros and cons to having a dynamic and sometimes invisible disability. Next slide. So I thought before I shared a bit more about my story, it would be important to share this voice of a person with an invisible disability who has to make these decisions about disclosing or not. Next slide. Um, I don't have to make as many decisions about disclosing my physical disability because it's it's very apparent if you see me in person. So this is the first um, picture that I received of my youngest daughter. Actually, the first image I was able to see of her because I had my, uh, my C-section under general anesthesia. So when I woke up, they told me that she was fine, but she was taken to the NICU. And I couldn't compute those two things making sense together. Um, and so also as a disabled pregnant person, despite me liking my team, I still have a very deeply embedded fear um, and distrust in a lot of the um, medical industry when it relates to my family. So I just couldn't make sense of these two things. I didn't feel like they were telling me something. Um, and then when they showed me this image, um, it, and I'm very familiar with lots of medical things. So I knew that, you know, this was somewhat common for lots of babies who are born a few weeks premature as she was planned to be. But it was a really scary and hard 24 hours for me not being able to see her, touch her, understand. And so as I think back on that, I do wonder like, what was stopping everyone from allowing us to meet and touch uh, for 24 hours, which was really long for me as a mom. Um, next slide. And so I'm going to tell this kind of three stories with words. And so um, we did get my daughter home. This was my youngest. That was a picture of my youngest. Um, and I'm holding her. And this picture I look back on to often remind myself that I can do hard things. <laughs> this was probably uh, one of the hardest times of my life. So I am in bed because six weeks after my daughter was born, I fell and broke my hip. So my disability causes my bones to break easily. And I hadn't broken in years and years and years, but, um, but I did break at a really critical time. And so I look at this image and I realize, oh my gosh, how much I had going on. I had this new baby. Um, my mom had just briefly stopped in to visit. So that was fun, but it was mostly my husband and I, and my son here is in the middle. He is in a back brace because he had had like a really complicated um, spinal fusion. He's got his fidget toy out, which was that an indication of like his on the go constantly, but trying to keep him safe in this back brace. And then also my little one, Hannah here was seven and we got the cat in the bed. So just a lot going on here. Next slide. Um, and I felt my anxiety rising and I couldn't figure out like, is it because I'm stuck in bed? Is it because I'm overwhelmed? Um, you know, and I really didn't know, like, who am I supposed to talk to about? Is it a OB thing? Is it my PCP thing? Um, and I just didn't have clear answers, even as somebody who works in this field is a psychologist, you know, has a lot of privileges that a lot of people don't. Um, I also love looking back at this picture because it reminds me this, so this was the first outing after I broke my hip. Um, so we, we had a wedding to go to, and so we got all dressed up and, um, it was a really hard day because I was still like adjusting to being in my chair and pain and babies and kids. And, um, but it was also a really good day to start to see that, um, into the tunnel of me being, um, stuck in bed at a time that I wanted to be up and, and with my family. Next slide. I did around this, this time, sorry, of the, the wedding picture here, um, start taking medication for the first time in my life. And it was really helpful to allow me to rest. It helped my mind cover in some ways. And so it's still really beneficial um, to me. This was our family shortly before COVID, which was another major challenge for all of our mental health. Um, and this one is, it reminds me that uh, my youngest was on the go very quickly and, um, and has just, all my kids have added so much joy. Next slide. 
And I think this last one is our latest. Um, it's a little bit glitched in my um, in my system. Oh, there we go. All right. So they this is us now. So my kids are 16, 13, and 6. And, um, you know, different challenges. But I appreciate the perspective that I've had and, and the opportunity to reflect on my own mental health through even designing this presentation. It's opened up even conversations that our family has had during dinner. I think, um, you know, there's this fancy word called me medical... Uh, sorry, diagnostic overshadowing, which means that when you have a disability, other things in your health are often missed because your primary disability overshadows it. And I think as a disabled person, we can do this as well. So really reflecting, having the opportunity to reflect back and with a focus on my mental health during this journey has allowed me to see things that I didn't see before, which really reminded me um, how that's probably true for so many other people. So thank you so much for allowing me to share both my professional work in this as well as my, my personal experience. And I am really excited to answer some questions from this incredible group. Thank you. Oh, I, not yet, not yet, I'm not, <laughs> sorry. Um, Sorry about that. Go ahead, guys. Okay. I um, wanted to tell you about these resources that have a few on this slide. Um, there is a childbirth preparation support tool. There's some great disability and pregnancy resources, and then also some resources for public health nurses related to this topic. So um, now I'll pass it back to Mia to lead us through some questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Ayers. I almost teared up many times during your presentation. And I just have to say your family takes the cutest photos ever. Um, but I learned so much from both you and Dr. Brown. And so I just want to express my gratitude on behalf of everybody here. Um, a reminder for everybody here that we will send you a brief survey. We would love your feedback. And again, we'll be sending the slides, the webinar recording, and our fact sheet on disability, pregnancy, and maternal mental health tomorrow. So now we're going to launch a quick poll. We would love to know your initial thoughts, feedback on your experience today. Did you find this webinar informative, helpful? Go ahead and take 30 seconds a minute to go ahead and answer that. We're seeing a lot of yeses. Thank you so much. Some somewhats. We really appreciate you giving your feedback. We really try to take a learning approach to everything that we we do here at MHLA. Awesome. We'll give that a few more seconds. Thank you all so much. So much engagement and participation to, from all 300 of you, 312 of you here. Just amazing. Awesome. Great. Letting the last few trickle in. Awesome. Thank you all so much. We really appreciate it. Okay, great. So we're going to go ahead and end the poll so we can move into the Q&A. I will stop sharing my screen. Awesome. Okay, great. Let's go ahead and dive into some questions. So I'm seeing from Allison, how do people with disabilities find support for having a baby in their city? Dr. Ayers, would you mind Taking that yeah. one. Yeah, this can be challenging because when you start to look for resources, some of the classes are not available unless you're mandated to take them by Child Protective Services, which is frustrating because there should be more proactive ways. And then some classes are also not accessible. But what I would start with is what you know classes or resources supports do you want and need, and then figure out what accommodations may be possible to make those available to a person. Some centers for independent living or SILs, um, and there are centers connected to every county, um, offer specifically groups related to parents with disabilities. Um, and then we have a number of online groups as well, including the Dis Disabled Parenting Project, where sometimes you can find people in your um, state or region or get support on things that aren't necessarily local or, or in person. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, if one of the staff can drop a link to the Disabled Parenting Project, that would be great. I think that's a great resource to share with everybody. All right, next question is, what do you suggest is the best way to get into perinatal mental health as a PMHNP? And are autoimmune diseases being treated as a disability seeing that it affects 80% women? 
Does anybody want to take that one? What do you suggest is the best way to get into perinatal mental health as a, I'm assuming that abbreviation or that acronym is perinatal mental health nurse practitioner. If, if, if we can't answer it live, um, perhaps it's something that we should address offline. Yeah. I'm seeing some nods. Um, yeah. Is the question about how to get into that specialty or how to get into the service? I think that's what I'm confused about. So if they could expand. Yeah. So the second part of the question was, are autoimmune diseases being treated as a disability? Is that something that Dr. Brown, you've seen in your work at all? Yeah, yeah, I can comment on that. Certainly in our definition of disability, um, we included autoimmune diseases. Um, I think it sort of depends on the research study and, and the breadth of work that's done. It also depends if you're serving individuals, how they self-identify. But certainly, for example, rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, conditions like that are certainly very common in the individuals that we've interviewed in our, in our groups. And I think they're great examples of how you know, disability can be invisible many times for many of these autoimmune diseases, which speaks to some of the issues that Kara talked about. Thank you for that, Dr. Brown. And we have a question here that says, to what, oop, it's moving, to what extent can state government entities support perinatal care for women with disabilities? Dr. Ayers, did you yeah. want to take that one? Um, yeah, I'm learning some great things from Ohio. We pulled together a work group that has a number of government, state government entities, including we have our um, early intervention teams, which can um, help with things like WIC, um, which can get uh, moms with disabilities as a very specific, specific example, you know, um, premixed formula, which sometimes can be helpful if a mom is blind or um, has uh, more challenges mixing the formula. So that's been a cool outcome that we've changed the way our WIC um, works. So we have early intervention, developmental disabilities department, um, child protective services. Uh, I think there's like eight different state entities that work together to figure out ways to support um, better perinatal care for women with disabilities. And what instigated this in Ohio was that we just passed a state law that prohibits discrimination on the basis of disability in custody and parenting. So that was kind of the momentum that got us started. Laws like that have been passed in about half the states with um, a handful of other states either pending or, or people working on getting them across the finish line. So um, your state may also have a way to kind of use that as momentum. We basically told the state departments about that and said like, hey, we you bet, you know, we bet you probably didn't know about this new law and let's get together and talk about how to um, improve outcomes for people with disabilities in Ohio that are parents. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, okay, there's another great question here. How do we get more involved in helping this research? I am a disabled social worker who feels I am often the only one talking about this. I can jump in and I'm sure Kara has thoughts as well. Um, I mean, it's it's great to be able to meet service providers who are disabled themselves. A lot of the women with disabilities that we talk to talk about how much they wish that they were interacting with more providers with similar lived experience as them. Um, certainly in the US, the Center for Disability and Pregnancy Research is a great um, resource and I think we'll be providing the link for that. Um, but I think that experience is really common. A lot of the people we talked to also felt like they were the only one of, you know, whether that was in their pregnancy care experience or as a service provider. And I think that really speaks to the importance of networks and connections. Um, and so I think anything that people can do to bring people together and connect people with resources is, is really helpful. Um, those are just a few thoughts, but I don't know, Kara, if you wanted to add to that. Yeah, I think we have a small enough world that, uh, you know, I would love to hear from you and, and learn and connect more. Um, our um, Hillary and I are part of the um, Disability and Pregnancy Research Center in our work. And, um, you know, there's a website with that. We can try to drop that in the chat. Um, the Disabled Parenting Project also has people that are interested in research, either as researchers or people that want to see better, more inclusive research done. So um, connect with us after this and we'd love to talk. Great. Awesome. Um, there's a, another great question here, um, which in summary is, 
it sounds like it's a provider. Wait, it's moving. I'm sorry, everybody. There's lots of questions coming in. So it says, what suggestions do you have about approaching a conversation with someone who may not have disclosed a disability, but there is a suspected invisible disability um, in order to provide accurate information about increased risk factors for maternal mental health? Basically, this person wants to know what the respectful or good approach to asking about something that someone hasn't disclosed in order to better educate them on resources and support. Yeah, I think this is a really challenging one and why I remind people when I say like, when you work with disabled parents or um, pregnant people with disabilities, most are not going to necessarily visibly look disabled, whatever that is. Um, and also, you don't necessarily have to claim an identity of disability to be able to access um, equitable care and anti-ableist care. So, you know, identifying with a disability, especially if you have an intellectual disability comes with a lot of stigma. And there may be, from a person's perspective, no benefits to identifying with a disability, but instead it's like uh, voluntarily, it feels like taking on a lot of baggage and weight of the stigma. So I think one of the tricky things is, is that while I can know that, um, you know, a certain percentage of our population meets this criteria, if I were to ask a group, they wouldn't necessarily raise their hands and identify as such. So um, the best way to approach this, I think, is to, increasingly universally design our programs to where we're offering accommodations to make things more equitable and to where we are, um, you know, weeding out that ableism as we see it. That way we don't have to worry about or we don't have to rely on just this like individual identity as kind of the ticket holder path program to like get services. Um, these services should be available to everybody who needs them based on their needs. Love that. All right. Somebody asked, Sonia asked, in the study, are you finding that providers follow and respect the APAP? If plans are not followed, what can be done about that? Dr. Iris, would you like to take that one? Yeah, so our APAP is based um, on health empowerment theory, which means that our top priority is centering what the disabled pregnant person wants, what they find is most important. And a lot of the research on birth plans clarifies that it's not so much that what you plan happens, like it's not about predicting the future, right? So there's lots of reasons that a birth plan um, can go off course, whether it be the fault of providers not following it or a myriad of other reasons. So um, we don't so much look for success of the intervention as that the birth plan happened as exactly as we'd hoped, but we look for success with the intervention and in that the person feels more empowered. Um, they have a more clear view of what disability related supports are available to them with pregnancy. Almost, um, you know, many times when I start this intervention with people, if you just ask the question of like, what supports do you need during pregnancy or during labor and birth, people are like, well, I don't know, you know, as any first time parent, especially or, you know, pregnant person, like, you don't know what you don't know, you know, what's available. And so it's really about the conversation about, you know, here's what's worked for other pregnant people with disabilities, would any of this work for you. And so that part is so much more valuable than, you know, kind of like, did it happen exactly as we planned. Thank you. And then the last question we're going to take before we close is, can you dive deeper and connect why this is about reproductive justice? I'm not sure if that's something that we can answer in one minute, but I don't know if either Dr. Brown or Dr. Iris wants to try to tackle that. Also, it's okay if not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it, all this can connects to reproductive justice and that, you know, disabled people have a right to build families as well and lead healthy um, happy lives as they define. And so, and that's harder than it should be at this time. So um, I know that's way too simplified for that answer, but um, there's a lot more we could say about access to um, a lot of different services, but I'll leave it at that for now. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Ayers. And as we close in the last minute or so here, we just want to say thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, feel free to stay in touch. You can follow us on social media. You can visit our websites. Um, we'll be sending all of these things out. We'll actually send them about an hour and a half before the webinar, but look out in your inboxes tomorrow for this, um, this slide deck with all of the links here if you'd like to continue following and connecting with us. Thank you all so much. Take good care. And thank you, Dr. Ayers and Dr. Brown. We really appreciate you lending your expertise and experience today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye.